תהיי בסדר. אני יודעת. לא בי פיין. זאת לאק, תודה רבה. אוקיי, תודה לאק. אוקיי, let's go. <laughs> uh, it's a beautiful moment uh, to see everyone coming in. It's like a, it's almost like an opening when well, all of a sudden everyone is there. So it's great. Um, then allow people to connect and then we're going to start. And I know that slowly um, um, build up, so it's okay. And we still don't have an ICOM song to open this uh, session. So for the, mm -hmm. the last one, we are going to do, we're not going to sing anything. We're just going to put some music. You mean, you mean him, not the truth of the song? Yes. Okay. Anthem. It could be a poem. We could, uh, you know, just write something. Okay. So um, good afternoon for us. Good morning for all our guests. Uh, thank you for joining us for the second um, Uh, meeting in our series about design and thank you very much to my partner Alan Lipton from Cooper Hewitt who I've dreamed for years to have uh, this uh, conference with you and then uh, Zoom allowed us and uh, thanks to the American Embassy and ICOM Israel for uh, allowing us to have this uh, wonderful series uh, and another opportunity to talk about uh, design and uh, different aspects that we thought are relevant for the future of museums. I don't know, I see that you want to Yeah, say. sure. Um, so what we decided to do today was talk about collecting design. And we're going to hear from three amazing curators. Uh, Narit Goshen, who is a curator of archeology, span will start us off at the very beginning of human creation, which is so fantastic, especially coming from uh, your country, your region, where, where so much of the origin of human civilization exists. And then um, we're gonna have two talks from curators from the Smithsonian Institution. I am a curator at Cooper Hewitt National Design Museum, which is um, part of the Smithsonian. And the Smithsonian is actually a network of 19 museums and research centers and our national zoo. And so we're gonna be hearing from my amazing colleague, Catherine Ott, who's from the National Museum of American History about her work designing, uh, collecting objects related to the history of medicine, which is so fascinating and so important to our time. And then my colleague, Andrea Lips from Cooper Hewitt is gonna talk about collecting digital artifacts and how museums do this and the, the choices that she makes and the conservation issues raised by that. So I think this, this beautiful arc from the past to the future really relates to what all of us are doing in museums, no matter what the medium or the genre, we're thinking about the history and we're thinking about these um, new ways that art is made and, and how museums can, can track that. So I'll pass it on back to you, Galit. Thank you. Um, I think this, um, uh, if we think about it as curators, um, I think our first passion maybe is to collect the objects or first maybe to find them, then collect them, then present them, and then uh, work with the designers and the, and the public um, to really create an interesting discussion around uh, the importance of objects or their role in our life. And I think our um, hopes, dreams, expectations, and memories that we can uh, see in those objects. So this very complex uh, relationship that we have with those objects um, as uh, people, as curators, as um, I think as, um, as the mediators of those ideas is something that is, uh, is the center of this talk today. And we've started last time to talk about uh, presenting design, which is the most interesting part, meeting people. Uh, today, we're going to talk about collecting. And then uh, our third uh, meeting would be more about our work as curators. I think it would be more about asking good questions 
and maybe not having good answers always, or we'll see how it goes. Um, um, I'm just going to say two words in Hebrew. אנחנו מאוד שמחים על המעורבות של כל מי שמשתתפת ומשתתף איתנו. נשמח את השאלות לקבל בכתב בצ'אט, כדי שכל האוצרות והשותפות שלנו יוכלו לקרוא אותן ולהתייחס אליהן בדיון הסופי. אז אנא כתבו אותן שם, ואנחנו מתחילות. Here we go. Um, I would like to invite Tom to introduce Nurit. And um, wish everyone a very interesting afternoon and wonderful morning. Hi, everyone. Um, I would love to present uh, our very, very dear uh, first speaker today, Nurit Goshen, which uh, many of you know. She's uh, the creator of the, um, she's the creator of the archaeology uh, of the Kalkolit and Bronze Age. Um, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly. I'm always <laughs> puzzled with that. Uh, um, at the Israel Museum in Jerusalem. Um, she's created uh, many exhibitions and projects dealing with these uh, ancient objects. And she studied the archaeology and art history in Tel Aviv University. And um, uh, she does many, many projects in these, in these regions that are uh, so, so important. Um, she, is, she also teaches at our um, program for design curatorial studies. So we are always making that um, connection. And when looking at archaeology and object, Nurit always highlights both the social mechanisms leading to a design and the relationships between people and artifacts uh, in the past and present. So, Nurit, the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I am absolutely excited and nervous to be speaking here. Uh, thank you to Helen and to Galit for inviting me. And I am honored to be speaking next to Catherine and Andrea, and of course to ICOM Israel and to Polina for organizing these uh, lectures that we are enjoying uh, throughout the months in the summer. Um, and so let me begin. And so I was uh, invited to talk about collecting design and I'm actually an archeologist curator, an archeology span curator. And I was thinking, what am I gonna speak about and what am I gonna talk about? So first of all, I'm the curator of the Calcolithic and Bronze Age periods, which means I'm collecting artifacts that are um, from the region of Israel, uh, dating from 4500 BC to 1200 BC. Um, and so it is starting in prehistory, not in the beginning of humankind, but really uh, early days. And I will show some art artifacts from that period. Um, at the end of the period, at the late Bronze Age, around 1300 BC, um, we start seeing these artifacts that we see here. These are in my storage room. These are anthropoid sarcophagi, coffins, human-shaped uh, coffins that are also the hallmark of the archaeology wing. This is the entrance gallery to the, to the wing and kind of they are greeting us and the visitors as they come in. Um, and so kind of there's always the tension between what is in the storage room and what is in the gallery and how do we collect it. I named the, the lecture uh, collecting the uncollected because lately I've been having many issues with wanting to present things that are not necessarily the go-to artifact that we present in the galleries and so I'm building up to to discussing my pains and my troubles and sharing them with you but also trying to uh, guide your gaze kind of into what things perhaps we're missing when we're collecting only the go-to artifacts. And I'm starting, of course, with the Guerrilla Girls and 1985, a movement of feminists, and up till today, a movement of feminists uh, um, and uh, activists that are trying to raise awareness of race, racial and, of course, gender inequalities in the art, art world, world. And they're raising the question of what museums are collecting, what do we have in our collections, and definitely this is a wave that is affecting uh, many museums now thinking of and revisiting what they have in their collections. I'm not going to touch in this lecture um, of the hot topic of collecting archaeology in the sense of ethical and legal question, uh, because there are many aspects to it. And this is a whole big, entire different series. So I'm going to connect this to mainly to design and to the artifacts themselves. And this is kind of the Guerrilla Girls as tapping into the art world and to different audiences that perhaps archaeology is not their go-to 
ID, um, raising questions of what do we collect and what do we think, you know, what effects were we're collecting and how are we affected basically by our um, zeitgeist, our, the, the spirit of the time that we're living in. So the journey I will take you through starts with excavating in the field. Actually, where do we find these artifacts that we're collecting as archaeologists? Then excavating collections and archives, and then collecting stories. So these are kind of my three stories. So excavating in the field. Uh, as Tom mentioned, I'm also an archaeologist and excavated both in Israel and in Greece. And you can see the joy of identifying something that is exciting. It looks like a lump of clay, but actually it's a loom weight. Uh, and so, and it's complete and whole and uh, been a subject of one of my articles. So obviously I'm joyous uh, from that and I will talk further. If we talk about archeology span and design and why this is such a natural connection uh, between the, the two fields, because if we think of archeology, span archeology span is the study of past cultures mainly by the material culture they left behind. So unlike history, where we will look at texts in archeology, span we will look at material culture and try from that uh, build uh, abstract cultural aspects such as you know worldviews, socio-political order, religion, ideology, from what is left behind, what people, what materials uh, they left behind them. And so in a way, if you think of designers and perhaps uh, my fellow speakers will correct me, if you think of designers are trying to answer to uh, worldview, social political orders, religion needs of their society, or they're trying to change it, they're trying to make it different or highlight different ideas. We're actually tracking back from their designs, we're tracking back these ideas and ideologies from what is left behind. And so it's always kind of complimenting for me to listen to design lectures because it opens up, you know, the creative thoughts of what perhaps people in ancient times also used. And so if you think of archaeology and you think about collecting, archaeology went through different phases and we're kind of in this uh, era that is a continuum from ancient times. And I start with the Laocon, this very famous statue, because it is actually mentioned by Winkelmann in the, Winkelmann in the 1700s, who is basically the first art historian talking about um, ancient art, uh, but actually marks for me this idea of looking at archaeology as art. We're collecting what are artistic, uh, what is beautiful, what is artistically important. We're actually collecting art. We're not really collecting archaeology if we're collecting ancient artifacts. Um, and so this is kind of uh, the opening, the starting uh, movement. We can see this also in the cabinet of curiosities, these artifacts that are fascinating, that are also appealing, that are beautiful, that you can talk about. This is kind of how it starts. Then in the 1800s and 1900s, we move, we move to this more uh, ideological, national, colonial looks of archaeology. And what we're looking at here, this fantastic photo from the excavation in Ur in Iraq is we see the native people dressed as Iraqi people and we see the two posing Europeans pretending to really excavate because they were <laughs> not doing the hard labor, labor but they, are, they have the photo um, excavating the site of Ur and the publication of the excavation, the title of it is Abram, Recent Discoveries in Hebrew Origins. So you see that the motivation is actually completely Judeo-Christian ideology, looking for the origin of Western civilization all the way in Iraq. And so we can see these trends and ideas of what we're collecting, what we're looking for. There is a fantastic PhD from 2015, and I forgot the name of the author, so I apologize, who is talking about actually how Leonard Willey, um, the excavator, was very mindful of the trend of what people wanted to, to, to hear about. And so he on purpose used and highlighted these biblical affiliation in order to raise funding in between wars where funding was scarce. So he was using these ideas to kind of continue his excavation of war, even though he knew that not everything is 100% connected to Abraham, uh, but it worked <laughs> for me. 
rim, but it served the ideology and the fantastic artifacts from war you can also see in Philadelphia, not so far from you, um, at UPenn University, because it was a joint excavation. Um, in Israel, of course, we cannot avoid the national trends of excavating and the ideas of excavating. And perhaps the most iconic excavation is Masada in the Judean desert, the site where the uh, Jewish rebellions uh, committed mass suicide because they were they would rather be dead than um, surrender to the Roman um, military. And here we see Gal Yadin, who was also chief of staff before he went on to excavate Masada, um, excavating the site. And it's definitely part of the ideology and the ethos of Israel, Israeli archaeology presence. And so the motivation and what people are looking for is evidence and justification for nationalistic ideologies. Um, even though I'm talking about these ideas as in past tense, we're actually um, uh, not beyond them. So we still are looking for the art. We're still looking sometimes to the um, historical, to the national uh, ideologies. We cannot avoid our tendencies to look for them. Uh, but we also try and look more into the material and into the uh, into uh, defined and what they tell us in what we call social archaeology, processual archaeology, etc. But what we do understand, looking at these trends and reminding us also of the guerrilla girls and kind of being aware of our own subjective, is since the 80s, also in archaeology, we understand that we're starting to interpret at the end of the trowel's edge. So basically every move we make in an excavation is an interpretation, it's a decision what we're gonna collect and what we're gonna discard, what is important and what is uh, meaningless. And so here you see Rachel in an excavation in Cabri. And if you look at what she's standing on, it seems like dirt because she's standing on dirt. But if you look closer and if you have a trained eye, you can start to see that here are some shirts and here are some more pottery shirts and she's standing on something that starts to look like finds and artifacts. It is a known thing that if you have in a dig, if you have a flint specialist, for example, someone who is uh, specializing in stone tools, people will find more stone tools in the excavation because there will be someone who is pointing them and making them aware of that. I am a freak of plaster, of wall plaster and of painted plaster. And so when I'm around, people are collecting plaster and showing it to me to make sure that it's okay to discard it or do we need to collect it? Just by my presence there, I affect what we're collecting. Not to keep you in suspense, what we have under our feet, this is a medium photo, I will show you in the middle in a few minutes more. But what we see is we see all of the black buckets of what we discard of are the basically what we, dis, we describe as the fill, the sediment, the dirt. These are we taking away. What we have is the colored buckets that we have here and here, and they are tagged, and they have a tag that is basically telling us what the finds in the bucket, where they're coming from, and then we can reconstruct it in our offices, etc. Reconstruct the field again. If you see here, there are also bags of soil, because now we understand that there is a lot of information also in the soil itself, so we are actually collecting soil sample something that in the past we wouldn't have even thought of thinking of collecting. We're sifting them, we find even smaller finds, etc. So our understanding of what is a find, what is an artifact, what is valuable is changing and shifting through time. We're not just looking for the laocon, we're also collecting dirt. And all of that will tie in the end of what we're displaying in the gallery. So again, just to show you what we see, what she was standing on. So this is Zach, he's actually her current fiance and they met in an excavation. So you can also find soulmates in an excavation. Uh, but what we're looking at is basically a storage room filled with jars. Each jar is about a hundred liter, can contain about a hundred liters. Uh, we know now of fluid uh, and we have tens of them in each room of the storage room of the Canaanite palace that is in the Galilee in Israel. Um, and when we're looking at jars, of course, we'll collect the jars. Of course, there are artifacts. We'll also collect all the little pieces around it. 
but now we know to collect even more. So we will try and start taking samples from the bottom side, the side that was not exposed to the air. Here you see us wearing gloves and use aluminum foil not to contaminate the sample. And we're collecting them to take them to a lab to gas spectrometry to, to be tested. And from this spectrometry, we learned that in these jars, we had wine, but not only, we can't say just wine, we can actually know that we had red wine. And we can know that not only that we had red wine, it was seasoned with honey and mint and other flavors. So we can actually from this fairly ugly shirt can say a lot about what people were drinking 3,700 years ago in a palace in the Galilee. So we're starting to collect different information. It puts us in a bigger worldview kind of scheme because we know that these type of blended wines, mixed flavor wines were also drank, for example, on the Euphrates at the same time in Mari. Um, and so we know that the king of Kabri, a king in the Canaanite kingdom in the Galilee in Israel was drinking the same types of wine as the king in the Euphrates in Iraq in one of the greater empires. So this little shirt is actually changing our world understanding and our world view of what is the Canaanite kingdom. So we're starting to collect more or ask bigger questions. After we come back from the field, we start sorting. And what you see here on the right is Professor Yosef Garfinkel from the Hebrew University, basically doing a typical reading, pottery reading. And so you actually see the tag, one person is holding the tag, another one is writing on the computer, and they're going through the shirt, looking at what they have in each location. What, is, uh, what types of pottery we have, um, are they cooking vessels, serving vessels, what date they belong to, et cetera, et cetera. Here in the lab, you can see actually all the shirts organized, just the indicative, indicative, you see only the rims and you can see some restored vessels. What happens to the shirts that after they've been analyzed, some of them are saved because they're publication worthy, but a lot of them are being discarded. This is a heartbreaking moment for a student of archeology span to go to the field after he painstakingly stackingly collected every shirt to see many of them being discarded to the side. This is a Tel Gezer, for example, so these are artifacts that deemed uncollected. Then everything will come back to the gallery. Um, and so now we're moving from the field, understanding that already in the field, we decide what is collected, what is not collected. Then we're moving to collecting in, the, in basically collections and archives. So in the gallery, this is, a, this is an image of one of the galleries that I'm in charge of, uh, showing the late Bronze Age about uh, third, like 1300 BC, um, and we see many kind of, we see large, beautiful sculpture or architectonic uh, pieces. We see many beautiful artifacts within the cases. And actually this is part of kind of this mania, uh, which was beautifully uh, quoted by Edmond de Vaz, of all the passions, of all without exception, the passion of the Bibelot, is perhaps the most terrible and invincible. The man submitted by an antique is a lost man. The Bibelot is not only a passion, it is a mania. So us people looking for these beautiful artifacts is definitely something that is possessing our life and controlling what, uh, what we're doing. Um, and so we look at storage rooms, we're starting to think of collecting stra strategy. And I love this image of the museum in Olympia uh, in Greece, where there are like hundreds of uh, warrior helmets, and you can start to see what is the strength of this collection. Usually, I also have image from the Smithsonian Museum because they have beautiful, a series of beautiful images from the Natural History Museum, where actually you could see all the butterflies. But I said, we have Smithsonian people here. I'm not going to show their picture to them. Um, so, so it's not on display. But actually thinking, what is the strength? What do I have in my collection? What is the strength of my collection? What is the weakness? And what do I want to say with my artifacts, the artifacts that I have? So you start looking and scavenging and looking through hundreds of boxes that you have in your storage room uh, and looking through archives and all kinds of documents about them. And you start sifting them. And for example, these 
unremarkable boxes that contain all kinds of bags and all kinds of pieces of bone will become a magnificent artifact that I cannot tell you exactly what it is, but it will be in display in a few months. But it is actually compiled. So from these many little pieces, we will create a beautiful object. So actually, we're also excavating the, um, the storage room, looking for what we can actually develop further, reveal the secrets, and perhaps even just creating the artifacts from bits and pieces. What I can show you, which is perhaps the least exciting part of this collection, is two silver toggle pins with the duck heads at the end that were found in a burial, and they are just fantastic and exquisite, and they're just beautiful, and they're part of this larger assemblage of fantastic object and it's just kind of scavenging through what you have and deciding that now we're going to put the time into that. Of course, there are the immediately compelling and beautiful artifacts that we cannot ignore, like the thinker of Yaoud. This is how we call this jug. It was found in a burial next to a very similar jug, just without the person. And when it was found, it was obvious it has to be in a museum because it's so beautiful and compelling and we cannot uh, ignore it. Um, but for me, it was a problem because it's a one-off, it's a unique. And in my galleries, I try to show the hallmark. I try to show the story of the period. And this is such a rare artifact. It's an odd one. And so I was conflicted what I'm going to do with it. And eventually, of course, it's on display, but it's outside of what we, um, the normal narrative that I have in the gallery. And now I'm coming to kind of the point of what I was trying to say, and this is an odd to the unattractive artifact. So many times we discard artifacts because really they're absolutely ugly, like this one. This is a few centimeters long tip of an awl. So this is how you can imagine this artifact if it was complete. It is made of copper uh, with arsenic and lead. It has at the end, it has a little bit, uh, little pieces of wood, so you know it had a handle, but it is 7,300 years old. So it's actually the earliest copper artifact we have in the Eastern Mediterranean. And so when I look at this ugly artifact, I think to myself, wow, this is really ugly. How am I going to display this? But it's super important. And so I am building a story around this artifact. So sometimes we collect uncollected artifacts. And it's really important because it's actually shedding light on these beautiful copper artifacts made in the lost wax technique on display in the gallery. They date to about 6,000 years ago because it is like our Lucy, it's the missing link. It shows us that the copper industry and the art has started already a thousand years ago before people started sculpting in the lost art, like the lost wax technique, a technique that is used still today. And this is in prehistory, people were not writing back then. And so starting, so this is actually how it is in the gallery. And it's actually the first artifact that you see when you enter the galleries talking about the metallurgy revolution. This is kind of our beginning inception moment uh, of this art. So it's all about the glasses you put on. You need to put ones that allow you to see the story that you're trying to say, to tell. And I will end with that. So if you're worried about time, I'm about to end. Um, so another project that I've done, and we're trying to recreate it in a bigger scale, is this pottery timeline um, that was on display in an Ashton exhibition. We're trying to put it now on display in the galleries. And what you're looking at is basically shards of pottery, but that they are organized. And I apologize that the video is in Hebrew, like the uh, titles are in Hebrew, but it starts from the early Bronze Age. So um, about 6,000 years ago, and it goes all the way to a crusader and Ottoman time. For example, this is Philistine uh, pottery, uh, and you can identify that, and you can see how, because Ashkenaz was a coastal city, you have also important pottery from Greece and Persian pottery and Roman, etc., etc. And so this tapestry is not only showing us the passing of time, but it's also showing us development of styles, of technology. Glazing pottery, for example, only came uh, in very later times. It shows us the different of materiality, how you choose certain materials for cooking pots, others for 
storage jars and even a third type for serving vessel, for example. So it shows us kind of the differences, but it also tells the story of archaeology. It trains our eyes to see from these shirts how a complete vessel can look like. So if we're looking at these tiny shirts, they're coming from this type of oinohoi, this type of jug. If we look at these, this one, this one here, it will come from a jug that is decorated in this way. So it kind of also tell you a story about how, how archaeology thinks, but also how we can tell from material and from style how a complete vessel was looked like, but also explain what I said in the beginning, how from these shirts we can go to talking about worldviews and we can talk about religion and ideas, something that is not in the material. The material is leading us to the abstract. And so trying to recreate this line now is not an easy task because as you saw, not every shirt are collected. Some of them are discarded. So I have an on going discussion with the antiquity authorities of what shirts will bring, how will we register them? Because these are the uncollected artifacts. Usually they are not destined to go to a museum. These are usually something that is stays in the storage room and uh, caters to uh, scientists, to academics. And so we're kind of trying to reach things that are not the go-to material. And it's creating sometimes, you know, conflicts or uh, discussions of how we do that. And so this is how it starts in boxes. And this is how it looks also in the antiquity authority, but this is in the good state if they're already uh, sorted according to types. So I have many days of sorting pottery in my near future in order to create our line. So we're trying to create something that is beautiful from something that we think of in the beginning is not collected. I will skip this. And then we'll just go into collecting story and say that basically what we're doing is uh, our own narratives, our own life views, our own like the current state that we're living in at the moment or are basically our habitus affects what we collect. So in previous time, we didn't think of collecting soil. We didn't think of collecting certain shards. We wouldn't have tested artifacts in the same way. But what we collect, what we have in our storage room, will also affect what narratives we can display in our gallery. So this is where we're going to, to collect our ideas and narratives and stories. And from there, our world experience also uh, comes to and things. Sometimes we find things that we're super excited about and these will be the things that will be on display in the gallery. And in times, great stories are hidden behind uninviting art artifacts. And we need to remember that, that sometimes even the ugly, <laughs> And I know that this is not a PC word, but even the ugly uh, holds this great secret and we just need to unravel it uh, and share it. And I'm sure that people will be just as excited as us uh, if we'll tell the right story. And so I thank you uh, for that. Thank you so much. And I think this is uh, my favorite object of your collection, uh, the unknown <laughs> object. Um, Whenever I have guests in, I have a replica in my house and whenever someone comes in, I go like, okay, what do you think this is? And then we start guessing of, of the different stories we tell ourselves about the subject. And it looks contemporary. It looks uh, as if it came from a design studio, thinking about, you know, a very contemporary piece that will make you think about eternity or whatever. Um, but thank you very much, Nolit. Um, thank you so much and for sharing our, your, all this story of looking for the objects and those, those different places and imagining what they have been and what they uh, will become. Thank you. And now we're it's to you, Ellen. Yes, that was so amazing. I took so many screenshots. <laughs> it's just a whole new paradigms for thinking about um, useful things and why they exist and how they show up in nature and, and it's just amazing. So it's my great joy to introduce to you Catherine Ott from the National Museum of American History. And I'm going to read directly from her biography because it's so beautiful and says a lot about, about her. Catherine Ott is a queer 
typically abled white curator in the Division of Medicine and Science at the National Museum of American History and an associate professorial lecturer in American Studies at George Washington University. For over 20 years, she has been thinking, talking, and writing about how and why people in the past were tagged for being different because of disease, gender, disability, sexuality, race, or just being annoying. <laughs> I love that. She has published on the history of medicine, disability, and material culture. Um, the exhibitions that she has curated include topics about disability, HIV and AIDS, polio, acupuncture, the Special Olympics, and the anniversary of the Stonewall Revolution that launched the gay rights movement in the United States. So I am just delighted to, um, to hear from this amazing Smithsonian colleague. Thank you for being here, Catherine. Good morning, everyone. Good afternoon, whatever your time zone is. Uh, and thank you, Ellen, for inviting me to be part of this panel. I am I am here at home in Washington, D.C., uh, Piscataway and Anacostan ancestral lands, as well as many other tribes who have passed through and who still live here. So I'm, I'm a grateful guest here in D.C. And uh, also waiting for Hurricane Ida, which is going to be here this afternoon. Hopefully, it, uh, the storm won't hit while I'm talking. <laughs> there are there are many privileges that shape my way of thinking. I have citizenship status, education status. I'm typically abled. I'm white. I also have queer supremacy. Um, but because of those privileges, I know I have had an unfair advantage for both survival and success in life. And because I have a smart mouth, I'm probably alive because of all those privileges. Um, I'm wearing a blue jacket, a blue and white flowered shirt. My hair is silver and I have quite a few character lines on my face. The wall behind me is old red bricks. Um, in disability circles, it's always good to describe who you are, what you look like for people who have, who need extra um, uh, language around that. So my, my opinions and actually my brain, I think for that matter, are a work in progress. So my remarks today are kind of more like ruminations. I outlined this talk several times and depending on what was foremost in my mind, if it was collecting, teaching, research, um, exhibitions, the telework impairment that makes me angry. Um, but additionally, because the importance of design shifts depending upon the questions asked of it, um, it could go in many directions. So we have today's version, <laughs> which is about how I think about the objects with which I work, collect, uh, and especially the relationship of disability with medicine. So kind of like Nuri, uh, uh, reframing the unattractive as it were. Um, and also like Nuri did, I, I wanna pin for now the big issues around the cultural role of museums, institutional genealogies, the systems of structural racism, misogyny, homophobia, and, and all of the multiple reckonings that are happening and influence our work. So I want, I want to start at the level of objects. I have a, a very complicated relationship with objects and it, it comes from years of being alone with them in storage areas, <laughs> um, talking with the people who give us objects, following visitors around the gallery and eavesdropping on their conversations. Um, just trying to figure out objects. And they have a, a unique kind of animism because they communicate to us and are a tangle, makers, materials, owners, era, the, the continual threats to their death, destruction, deaccessioning, all kinds of things are always threatening them. And 
Um, so for me as a historian, design is political. I think of design as an enabler of ideas, of ideas like actualized. It's that quality of objects that enables the idea to be known and conveyed. Um, design encompasses all the aspects of form and responses to it, materials, all that. It's the location where materials take shape with intention. Um, and that's where disability, medicine, bodies, health, difference, all the things that fascinate me come in to play. Disability is also a slippery category. Material culture provides an unfiltered record of how people imagine the ways bodies work and then the crisis that ensues when those assumptions sometimes fall apart. In many ways, objects bring bodies into existence um, and consequently, the ableist aesthetics of objects are on today's menu. <laughs> Assumptions about disability and disabled people are embedded in all the ways we understand the world, ourselves, communities, cultures, ice cream flavors, maybe not, maybe not actually, but as a highly skilled curator, I am sure I could write that label <laughs> or Chardonnay if it's not too early to start talking about wine. Um, Disability is othered or left out generally in scholarship and in talks, you know, the litany goes, race, class, gender, and other, blah, blah, blah. It's always the other in there somewhere. Um, and understanding disability is further complicated because there's no party line. There's no one take on it. There are many competing perspectives. There's a great diversity within disability it's, and it's also usually highly associated with illness or medicine or sickness, which is just not at all correct. Um, invisible disabilities, they're intermittent disabling conditions, temporary disability, disabling diseases for sure, mobility, sensory impairment, neural diversity, cultural differences, competing political positions about inclusion and even the era that we're examining, like being in many um, decades, being of a non white race or ethnicized in some way, or being female has been disabling. So I think of disability when it comes to objects, um, especially when it is unexamined as, the, as a cognitive wrapping of artifacts that it can, that can silently overpower the beauty and the utility and us being able to actually examine the object itself um, because of ableism. Ableism is that part of uh, stigma that relates to disability. It's the assumptions about what is normal, what a normal person can handle. Um, in the, it's present in all the systems. We have to navigate to find information, fill out forms, get food, find a lover, um, get a vaccine. Ableism is there. And I say that with confidence because most everyday tasks are not designed for clear and easy use. For many people, things are relatively smooth and achievable, especially once you know how to do it. But for a lot of people, and this is like one in four, like 25% or more of the population is, has a disability or impairment of some sort. So for most people, many of, I'll say many people, <laughs> it's problematic to accomplish things because the world is so not designed for them. So ableism is a, it's a mindset that's just as destructive as racism, homophobia, all of those. And it, it kind of, for people who are, who have a disability, it acts as an, like an emery wheel that just slowly grinds away at your sense of self and well being. Um, it's, it includes insensitive language like lame, crazy, moron, um, segregation of people with disabilities, and not just in special education classes, but all kinds of blocking of access. Ableism is having typically able people play disabled people in movies, 
um, it's designing for disabled people without including them in the process. It's assuming that people need or want to be fixed. Eugenics is really big um, in ableism and so, as is social Darwinism. So I wanna demonstrate ableism by talking about and around bodies that work except when they come up against objects that smack at them. Um, some of the moments of harm, apparent and non-apparent that ableism creates, we learn ableism at an early age. So this is a, a, a twist toy, a kid's toy um, that ha has three parts, you twist it around, you make funny bodies. Um, and it's also a, a highly stigmatizing disability toy for kids to play with and learn about because you learn what goes with what, you learn what is a mismatch. And if it's a mismatch, it's funny because it is like different, it's shocking or out of the way, it's funny. Um, and you learn that there's one correct body, that there is a norm. Ableism affects value um, of others from a very early age. It's um, so crisis, creativity, normativity are certainly through lines that are particularly relevant to disability. Um, through line, by the way, is very popular in my museum at the moment, but it's not popular enough. It has an acronym like like everyone says, oh, what's the T? <laughs> We're not quite short divergence because. Um, I love language and DC is brimming with buzzwords and I get sidetracked very easily. So big these days in my museum is transparency, probably uh, in many of yours as well. <laughs> asymmetrical work, asymmetrical schedules, asymmetrical anything, uh, new normal, which people use, but no one really knows what it means. The same for um, best practices, um, but back to disability. <laughs> but the uh, crisis brought on by ableism goes beyond the obvious accommodations and the, the uh, Americans with Disabilities guidelines or whatever the um, guidelines are where you are. It's really deep in our culture. And some, some fields of design and aesthetics are especially friendly to disability, like universal design, design for all, human-centered design, ergonomics, wabi-sabi is so disability friendly. Um, but others are hostile, like medical engineering. The goal there is usually to compensate for disability as discreetly as possible. It, it's, um, it's generated, medical engineering is generated from a place of deficit and stigma. So it's prosthetics that can pass. Um, invisible hearing aids, things that hide or mask or cover the non-normal. Graham Pullen has, has written about this, as have others like Sarah Hendren, me, <laughs> and, and a host of other people. The, the designs related to sanitary, hygienic, disposable products are also, also have an edge of ableism to them, like menstruation, is an embarrassing event. So let's make it sexy, fun, or invisible. Make it any something not about menstruation. Aging is another um, one, like gray hair needs to be colored. And there are a whole host of, of examples. Eyeglasses are a little bit different in this category because there, there's, there's many styles that are meant to be noticed and admired and attract others. So eyeglasses have a whole nother, I could do a whole lecture on eyeglass design. Um, for decades, disability and medical devices were closely tied to the destruction caused by war, both through the adaptation of technical innovations for domestic commercial use that benefited disabled people like lens implants, uh, the invention of the transistor, which gets used in uh, hearing aids, and there are also out of war come designs intended for making disabled vets whole 
or integrated into communities like prosthetics, carbon fiber, joysticks that come from aeronautics. Um, and there's another level through which ableism creeps into design thinking um, and of course, discourse in general, besides the physicality of objects and architecture, it's embedded in the way we talk about our collections, about objects, we interpret and describe them. Um, word use is a huge problem. It, and the subcategory of ableism for this is lexism, the kind of ableism found in language privilege, education privilege, and similar, using complicated language or insider jargon that excludes people who don't understand it. It's a significant problem with technical or scientific topics. It's everywhere in government and higher education. And also probably anywhere there is a studio with people populating it who have their own uh, vernacular. Um, it can be exclusionary. It's a, language is a, it's a major kind of social capital and we elevate certain communication methods and styles over others. There is the, the gallery label speak that is exclusionary in, in many ways when you think about it through a lens of ableism. Language competency is one of the most uh, powerful indicators of status. Um, and many disabled people don't even use language. They use a speech synthesizer or they use their bodies um, in movement, in motion. They stim, they flap, uh, they, they think in images. Um, the, the, the last, I'm looking at the time because I want I'm seeing that there, we're getting close to time. So the last thing I, object I want to show you to talk about ableism is um, an example from this is, <laughs> this is the closest I could find since I'm not in the museum, but you can find statues in almost wherever they're in a public park that's been there for more than 20 years. They, we talk about it as vandalism, um, damage makes us sad. But for me, it, like the Venus de Milo, um, has no arms and the um for me it's a celebration of disability and we're often we we often don't see the disability aesthetics embedded in objects because we're 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 looking at something else or we're so um trained not to stare or think of stigma so we ignore that piece of of uh that part of our interpretation um the, so I think I'll just stop there. I, ha, I could say a whole bunch more, but I'm going to uh, stop and hope to entertain some discussion. <laughs> Thank you. That was amazing. You bring us so many ideas to think about and uh, lenses for uh, critiquing our own language and our own categories. And it seems very interesting after hearing about the shards and fragments and that which is put back in the field and how some of that relates to how we think about human beings too. It's very profound and very important. Thank you. Um, I am now going to introduce my dear friend and colleague, Andrea Lips, who is Associate Curator of Contemporary Design at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum in New York. So we are the nation's design museum. She has created many exhibitions at Cooper Hewitt. She's currently working on an exhibition about S. Devlin. She recently uh, curated the exhibition Nature, the na our national design triennial. I got to collaborate with her on an exhibition all about beauty in which we raise some of these questions about what is included and excluded and what, what beauty means when we talk about design. Um, and we also co-curated the senses, Design Beyond Vision in 2018, where we created an experience that could be um, enjoyed and, and understood by people of all abilities and all sensory abilities. Uh, so we learned so much in, in creating that project. Um, Andrea is an incredible writer, curator, 
speaker, educator. She's been published in the New York Times, the Wall Street Journal, the New Yorker, and much more. Um, and I'm really grateful that she took time this morning to tell us about what she's doing with digital collecting at Cooper Hewitt um, and, and what she's finding, what she's choosing to, to preserve for the future and how, because it's very challenging. So, so welcome, Andrea Lips. Thank you, Ellen. Um, and just a quick thank you to Ellen and to Galit for uh, the invitation to participate today. And I'm honored, honestly, to be here with Narit and with Catherine. I've learned so much from both of your presentations. Um, so now I'm going to take us into the future <laughs> a little bit um, with collecting digital designs. So I'm gonna share my screen here, bear with me. Great, thumbs up, you can see that, terrific. Um, so also thanks Ellen for that lovely introduction and um, in addition to some of the, the exhibitions and, and books and things that uh, I've been working on, I am spearheading the museum's efforts to collect foreign digital work. And thankfully, I no longer really need to explain what foreign digital is, as I once did. I mean, it's not the iPhone, for instance, but it's what happens when we turn the iPhone on. Um, it's the apps, it's the interfaces, it's emoji and websites, it's the digital materiality of our, our daily lives. And so Cooper Hewitt, like all museums, has built a collection of objects made with analog physical materials. <laughs> we have, you know, plastic and fibers in our collection, paper uh, and ceramics. I mean, these are objects that are cared for in four curatorial departments, which you can see listed here. Uh, and these are just, you know, a few little highlights um, of some of the things that we have. But Digital material is, of course, uh, much, much different than any of these other materials. And so the, the practice of collecting digital material, digital design is very nascent for us at Cooper Hewitt um, and, and really for the museum field writ large. But it's something that we are pursuing with great vigor uh, as the pace of digital change really only accelerates. And so to tell you how we got here, uh, I'll start with the first digital work that we had acquired, uh, which was back in 2011, we had acquired um, the Clearview Highway typeface. Um, this was a lovely work that actually uh, increased legibility of uh, highway signage to ensure um, that it could be read at further distances. So here you can see the Clearview Highway sign versus um, a traditional uh, typeface that was used in highway signage in the United States. So we collected this into the drawings, prints and graphic design department, which although typography is certainly communication design, the department is positioned to care for works on paper, not digital works. So we collected the font files on a CD-ROM. <laughs> We put the CD-ROM in a manila folder. <laughs> we put that in a filing cabinet and we, that, that was it, that, we were done with it. <laughs> um, you know, so at the time we didn't have a, a curator who was focused on this type of material, nor the protocol to properly care for it. So uh, this was our, our first foray into collecting something digital. And then in 2013, that led to the museum's second acquisition of a digital work which was uh, an iPad app. Uh, it was called Planetary. Um, you can see just a little screenshot of it here. And this was overseen uh, at the time by members of our digital and emerging media team. Um, and the acquisition itself was important because it definitely underscored uh, the fact that code was a new material that we needed to wrestle with in the museum's design collection. So we collected the source code for the app. We made it um, publicly accessible on a GitHub repository. We printed out that source code on archival paper. You can see it here in a box on a storage shelf. Uh, and then of course we have our archival documentation. We had some screenshots, um, some of the designer's notes and some production assets. Um, but then what happened with this? Well, we discovered that um, four years later in 2017, the app had already broken. Um, so 
the source code itself had deprecated and was completely incompatible with the contemporary iOS, the contemporary operating system. So just think about how you constantly need to update your smartphone um, and your tablet apps to keep them functional. We have constant developments that are happening to hardware, to firmware, to web protocols, which all means that software must be in a continual state of evolution. So thankfully, this particular work was not irremediably lost, but as a result, we began to unpack what it means to collect digital work and how to do it. Because the digital as a, as a medium, as a material is inherently fragile. It's incredibly vulnerable and it's potentially short-lived. So all of this then, you know, really spoke to us of the importance of bringing all of this into the realm of, of curators and conservators who are trained to collect and care for work. Um, but of course, we didn't really know how to do this <laughs> for digital work. So what we ended up doing at the museum was we formed what we called a digital acquisitions working group. And because we are at the Smithsonian and we love our acronyms, um, it is lovingly called our dog. Um, and our dog sits at the nexus of our individual areas of expertise. So it includes curatorial, myself, um, and I am joined by uh, conservators. Um, I'm joined by our registrars. Um, and at the time when we initially uh, formed this group, we also had um, some of our digital media and a V uh, installation staff on. And so, you know, really kind of our dog then sat right there at the nexus um, of all of that. And, and through our work together, we really have discovered how deeply interrelated acquisition planning, stewardship and conservation and display are for born digital work. And really within our research, we found um, the theoretical work of Fernando Dominguez Rubio to be particularly helpful for us. And, um, you know, really kind of uh, this framing um, in advancing his own model about how digital fragility affects museum practices. Um, we found this to be uh, particularly salient, you know, really in, in the ways in which Rubio and Glenn Wharton were identifying the ways in which digital media push against standard and traditional museum practices and norms. So number one, digital works exist as circulating rather than stabilized objects. In other words, they're, they're objects that must be in perpetual motion in order to be kept alive. Digital works are multiplying rather than original singular works. They, they endlessly proliferate. <laughs> Digital works are regenerated or they're constantly remade as opposed to being authentic objects. And they are distributed rather than discrete objects. They are scattered across um, very different spatial, temporal, and, and property regimes. Um, they're objects who, whose identities are distributed across many different parts or components. So the other piece of this, though, is, you know, also, what are we collecting? So, you know, ultimately, we collect the source code and, you know, here are just some screenshots of um, some source code in the GitHub repository. Here's um, some nested file folders of some uh, some code that, that we have collected, you know, but on its own, the code doesn't really look like much, right? It's, it's when it's assembled and performed that it actually becomes the work. So in order to not only display the work to the public, but to preserve the work and to ensure its functionality, we need to translate that code into the piece that it is. <laughs> so how does all of this manifest in what we have begun collecting? Well, we do have things that we call um, sort of our, our more straightforward um, uh, works. Uh, we call these almost low hanging fruit. So these are, are works that are much more style uh, file formats. Um, you know, so here we have, you know, some guidance images for emoji, we have an accessible icon, these are, you know, SVG, PNG, EPS files, these are, you know, just are very straightforward um, uh, uh, files that we've collected, we collect the um, archival documentation around them, so that if for some reason we are unable to access these, we can, you know, try to tell their story in, in multifaceted ways with designer interviews, um, screenshots, photos of, of the works in use. Um, and, you know, we've also collected other types of visualizations that are presented as video files. These, again, are more straightforward to acquire and to maintain because we anticipate that these types of files will remain more stable um, into the future. So again, you know, whether these are, are um, MOV or MP4 file types, granted they're enormous, this is an almost 8.5 gigabyte 
video short showing um, the, uh, the the origin to the beginning of, of life at the moment when um, water begins to melt <laughs> and what happens um, at a molecular level. So um, so with all of these, then you know what we end up doing is we get the digital assets with a checksum which is provided to us directly from the designer and a checksum is like a verification tool to ensure data integrity. And then we ingest all of those digital files into Smithsonian's digital asset management system. So with, again, these types of files, we don't have to check on the obsolescence of them quite as, as regularly as other digital work. Um, and we don't necessarily have to maintain specific software uh, in order to access them. But with interactive digital visualizations, the practice of collecting work becomes much more unruly and nebulous to acquire and to maintain. So this is a, a work by Ben Fry called On the Origin of Species, the Preservation of Favored Traces. And what it is doing, what you're seeing right now is a screen recording. And uh, Ben Fry had visualized all of the changes that Darwin had made in each of his six editions of his very seminal book on the origin of species and the way in which he's tracking all of that is using color um, and, uh, and movement so that you can see that, you know, something which seems to us like a very seminal text is something that he was constantly working on up until the moment of his death. Um, so uh, this again is a file-based work. We collected the, the app file, um, which then becomes interactive in our galleries. So, you know, here we had included the work in a collections based exhibition. The designer himself, Ben Fry, had told us that it was important for this work to be displayed on a monitor with a touchpad from around the period when it was designed. Um, but once the exhibition closed, then the work reverted back to the code that is otherwise inaccessible until we re-embed it in an environment. So, um, Honestly, right now, we don't currently know if the work still functions unless we are able to access it. So you can begin to understand how deeply embedded display itself is in the preservation of this work. Again, thinking about those words of Rubio, digital work must be in perpetual motion to be kept alive. So another uh, example is uh, this interactive uh, uh, data visualization called Visualizing the Cosmic Web. This was a web-based um work for which we acquired the source code and the assets and each and every time we do uh, make a digital acquisition we do continue to learn from and hone our own practice so what was interesting with this was before we actually brought it in we did include it in our nature triennial um and we displayed it as a video for a number of different reasons rather than the actual interactive um so but what we actually have in our collection then again is the code. <laughs> you know, this is what we have in our digital storage systems. And we're eager to take it out of this very latent state and to enable it in an embedded, performative, active experience um, sooner rather than later to ensure that there's not irrecoverable loss with it. So again, thinking about how what we acquire is the source code, but we actually need to enable its, its active state in order to, um, to experience it. Um, another typology that we have collected is a website. Um, so this is watercolor map tiles, which was an open source website that is still alive on the web. It was designed in 2012 and it's a map that is zoomable, it's searchable, it's downloadable for free, all made publicly available by a, a Creative Commons license. We spent two years <laughs> untangling the work in order to acquire and to preserve it in a state of perpetual motion. Um, with a goal to ensure its future stewardship. So what we ended up doing was um, we worked very closely with the designer, Eric Rodenbeck and his team. Um, and with Smithsonian's own office of the chief information officer um, to copy all of the assets onto Smithsonian servers and to host the duplicated site on our own domain. And all of this now is still publicly available via a creative Commons license. And what was really interesting was, was in this process itself. So 
there's still the live site which exists and is um, hosted by Stamen Design, the original designers of this, but now we've duplicated the site and Smithsonian is, it, Smithsonian is overseeing this. You know, we have found ourselves really on the edge of precedent. Um, we are experimenting with an entirely new acquisition and preservation model for the museum sector. Um, by not just acquiring and archiving the source code and the assets, but by treating the source code as living and privileging the active performative state of the work in order to keep it alive. Um, and so uh, oftentimes the way in which we are, are, are talking about these things, we, we do find ourselves using biological metaphors oftentimes. Um, and that some of the work that we have to do in acquiring digital work is, is creating these frames and these, these boundaries, almost putting these works in the zoo if you will, while there are um, the original works as they exist out in the wild. So what's been fascinating about all of this is it's led us to realize that while we collect and we preserve the code, it is, again, that performance of the work that enables us to maintain and to properly steward it, at least into the near future, <laughs> so much as we know. Um, so our goal in acquiring interactive digital work is not only to preserve the work in its dormant state, but to preserve it in a way that makes the work accessible in a performative state. So it's not just about collecting the documentation of it, the screenshots, the screen recordings, the designer interviews. Um, it's not just about acquiring the preservation material, which are the archival formats, the source code and the assets, but actually doing it in a way that enables the performance of that work so that we can leverage them all together. Again, it's really doing it at that very sweet spot right in the middle. Um, because again, Rubio's words continue to ring in our ears about how digital objects exist as circulating objects. That is, they are objects that must be in perpetual motion in order to be kept alive. So um, this takes us really to the edge of um, where we have gotten uh, within our own practice. Uh, so you can begin to understand some of the challenges <laughs> of, of all of this work and you know, despite the best of intentions um, and our desire to uh, to acquire as much as exists out in the, the digital um, landscape and digital environment, we really have to take our time and do so with intentionality um, and to build the practice for the museum field at large. So, um, so you know, we also have to be patient <laughs> as we all are in, in the museum field. So with that, thank you. It's amazing, Andrea. I love that one of your pieces that you collected is about this cosmic representation. <laughs> and I feel like this, uh, this afternoon has been a cosmic experience um, from, the, from the edge of museum practice to the origins of it. It's, it's been really fascinating. So, so thank you. So I think Galit is going to... Um, invite questions and of course um, I have questions for everyone and would just love to hear hear more okay so before let's let's see if we have any questions and I, I haven't seen any in the chat so I'm going to uh, do you want to start with one of your questions um, yeah yeah I'd love to so so um Galit I was just utterly fascinated by everything you had to, to say. It's just, it's so new to me as a, as a paradigm. And I have some just like practical questions. So these shards, when they are sent away, you showed that image of like, it looked like a lawn covered with these primordial shards. Where did they go? Do they get sent back to the original site? Is there a sense of yes. Yes. return? Absolutely. They actually, yeah, they are returned to the original site. There's usually um, a map indicating where they are placed. Um, and it's often time that we actually excavate past excavation, the dumps of past excavation, uh, because people were not looking for certain things. So you actually go and re-excavate uh, old excavations and finding different layers, but then of course the context is destroyed. So you do lose some of the information uh, through that. But there is a, for example, a huge project um, in next, next to the old city and actually sifting through dump piles that are not organizedly excavated 
uh, in the Temple Mount. So it's actually, um, so sifting through that, they found a hoard like hundreds of bullae, of stamps, uh, of, on letters, etc. cetera. Uh, but it's a very common practice. We do it in most, it's because in the early 1900s, et cetera, uh, you were collecting certain things and not collecting others. And so now when you go and re-excavate, you find more. Um, so we do often do that. And I know that as students, we used to be kind of uh, sad about it. We used to, to, to be annoyed of like, we're digging the fill, we're digging the dump, you know, it's not interesting. But then you find the most fascinating stories that connect the story of archaeology to the story of people in ancient times and actually making the arch. Yeah. So, yes. So they are, they are officially, uh, sometimes they're just dumped, sometimes they're officially buried. And so there are actually burial sites for shared for shards. Yeah. And is there any concern that um, adventurers and tourists will want to dig them up and take them away? Like, I want a shard. Of course. <laughs> it's like the Berlin Wall when it came down, everybody wanted a piece of it. It's illegal to do that. It's but illegal it's to take yes, shards. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Um, not, not that I think that, you know, I assume that most uh, tourists that come to visit will have a certain memorabilia, you know, from their visit in their packages, etc. cetera. Uh, but we're less concerned that people will excavate these areas than excavate actual archaeological sites. So when there is an excavation going on, there's all, we're always in danger of looters coming and excavating because they know there is an excavation there. So they know this is a site. It so is they a know value, right. Uh -huh. yeah. And also excavate, like, and there are professional looters that also go and rob particular sites and they know where to go and dig because they themselves are professional in that. So we are always kind of worry like weary of of illegal uh digging um less concerned about the dumps if this is what they will dig we're actually quite relieved <laughs> you know, this is the, the lesser you know, the lesser uh circumstances yes mm -hmm. the lesser fascinating. Yeah. fascinating and i'm just thinking about of andrea and, and i'm thinking about uh, digital excavations about you know, 10 years from now, if you could look back and do some archaeology or digital archaeology diggings in your collection or in other locations, um, that would be incredible to look at it as we're looking at archaeology. Well, you know, and it's interesting because actually as Nuri was speaking, I kept thinking about, you know, just deep history and, you know, what is a, a digital collection going to look like for those, you know, far into the future. I mean, <laughs> you know, this is what is, is particularly challenging about our practice is that, um, you know, we're really having to kind of, you know, write the, the theory and the pragmatics of it as we're doing it, <laughs> which yep. is um, very, very challenging. And, and we're trying to do it, of course, with an eye towards, you know, preservation into the future, but we just really don't, we don't know. <laughs> so, so it's kind of interesting. Yeah. Well, and I was going to say what's interesting is actually, as Nareet, you know, mentioned with a lot of the shards that you're finding, you don't have the context mm -hmm. that exists yes. around them. And so that's one thing that, that we are really trying to build into our own practice is to, also um, bring in what we keep calling like supplemental materials mm -hmm. to help contextualize, you know, so again, you know, any types of, you know, screen recordings and screenshots, you actually can see something in potentially, you know, the, the digital environment in which it might have lived. Um, screen recordings of how someone might have interacted with something, you know, designer interviews, just again, to contextualize it, um, that that hopefully into the future will provide some important information for researchers and scholars. Interesting. I think this is what's so exciting about being a design curator um, is that you actually can um, relate to this uh, very beautifully long his timeline of objects and still talk about this very simple relationship between a person and an object and a memory or a thought. Um, and you can still read this experience very clearly. Um, I've been, I, I, 
I've been thinking about this future of the digital collection. Um, what should you put aside beside these uh, those objects? Maybe about the experience, maybe about our thoughts about those uh, experiences. Um, so looking backwards, I don't know, 50, 100 years from now, uh, would not be just the piece about more about what was my experience using this code or designing this code. So like looking at it from both angles, that would be interesting. Uh, I think Norit usually when we invited Norit to start uh, teaching at our program of uh, design curatorial work, um, I think three years ago, four. Um, and I think slowly we understand that people or designers rarely leave notes close to their pieces saying, uh, well, this object was this and this and so on. So sometimes we call this courses, no one left a little note next to the object. And now we can imagine um, our, its past, its future and its uh, importance. I have, I have a question for Catherine about um, COVID-19 and what uh, what your division is doing about collecting in relation to the pandemic. Um, the whole museum is collecting and each, we, we have six, I think, units with different um, focuses, like there's political history, entertainment, sports, work in industry. So each one of those are like work in industries, looking at workers, employment, unemployment, um, domestic life is looking at homemade masks. And uh, I think they're doing some of the humor that's been generated or from toilet paper to everything else. In my division, we're looking at uh, PCR equipment, which is used for saliva testing and also, and just generally testing. And um, the and a, a tricky one is death, how to deal with death and the, all of the consequences of it. And um, do, I've been working with a family whose father was a postal worker and passed away very early on and talking with them and thinking about if we're how to put death in an exhibition when it's so mm. contemporary um the so yeah we're we're doing the whole range of things from, and the, and we have had i think almost a thousand offers of masks from people <laughs> So how do you choose? Because we're, we don't we're collecting masks too. Yeah, right? I mean, it was really it's really like challenging. Yeah, it's like it's it's, it's like t-shirts. How many t-shirts does a museum need? <laughs> and right, well, uh, this is that question of the lens, you know, that yeah. Marie was talking about as an archaeologist, that you bring this motivation yeah. to what you dig up and save. And when you're looking, when you're in the middle of something like a pandemic, how do you judge what should be saved to tell the story in the future? So I'm, I was curious yeah. how you pick, because we're we facing a, that also. Yeah, there's a, the museum recently ha, uh, created a rapid response team because mm -hmm. we're in DC. So they go out when there's a protest for January 6th, they were there taking from the trash mostly to because that's that's kind of our the culture genius <laughs> yeah um but it's and, and the same with covid the rapid response it makes me really uncomfortable as a historian because i don't it, it's let's like Nareen, i know what's important to me but i don't know what 10 years from now will turn out to be the the, the most important aspects of it that we'll have missed and so the historian in me is really uncomfortable with all of it. 9-11 was another example of that. Yeah. So go ahead. Sorry. <laughs> no, I said that you're the one making the decision what will be remembered by collecting specific artifacts. It's on you to yeah, decide. I know. <laughs> <laughs> right. It's terrible. No pressure. And Andrea, you're collecting some digital material related to the pandemic. Can you tell us about? some of that or a particular piece like the New York Times 100,000 dead yeah. cover or infographic, some piece that they're really amazing and important. Yeah, definitely. And, and I just have to echo 
Catherine's reluctance <laughs> to doing some of this. It feels like such a big responsibility. And, and for us, Catherine at, at Cooper Hewitt, we've um, formulated what we're calling a responsive collecting initiative where we have been asking um, the staff of the full museum to nominate objects around COVID-19 and you know, the movements for racial and social justice and whatnot, just so that we can expand our purview and, and perspectives a little bit. And so some of the things that I have collected into the, um, the digital collection are the coronavirus medical illustration that was uh, created by the uh, CDC. And that of course was kind of, you know, the, the gray uh, particle with you know the red protrusions, the kind of spikiness of it. Um, so I worked with the the medical illustrators to collect that because of course that immediately gave an identity to this thing that we were fighting in the very early days. Um, and then one of the other things that I'm working through right now um, are some, as, as Ellen mentioned, some New York Times um, pieces of visual journalism. So one of them in particular is the um, the hundred thousand deaths. Uh, piece. So on the, the physical paper itself, um, the way in which it was presented was a list of, of names. So rather than any stories on the, the cover of the New York Times, they just listed names um, of those who had died. And then the digital version of it was um, sort of an endless scroll piece that you just scrolled through. So it you know, sought to, to visualize the immensity of 100,000 dead, which at the time in the US, we thought that was a lot. Um, and so we're, we're, I'm working very closely with the New York Times to figure out how to collect that. So again, we, we can allow it to be um, interactive um, for people into the future. So you know, thinking around, some of those ways also, you know, Catherine did, you know, talk about death in our galleries and whatnot, you know, using some of the ways that that um, contemporary designers and practitioners are, are approaching it to tell some of those stories. So yeah, so those are, are some of the things that we're that we're looking at right now. It's really um, just being in the middle of it. It's, you know, we're doing an exhibition that opens in December, and it's like, who knows what the state of the pandemic will even be. And then to be choosing, you know, these masks and this ventilator, and, um, a few political posters, and it, trying to somehow convey uh, the, the response, the courageous response of people who have simply tried to make an action of some kind in the face of this. That's how we're approaching it, but fascinating. Thank you. Amazing. Okay, since we're not having any other questions, um, I wanna thank everyone here. Uh, thank you, Catherine and Andrea and Norit for your amazing talks. It was an incredible uh, journey um, to just imagine this, uh, uh, our relationship in the future, past, present and future of objects and the way we approach them, not just uh, looking at them, feeling them, testing them, uh, really having this relationship with uh, those objects. I'm uh, missing a chat then. Um, and uh, thank you, Alan, uh, so much for, being uh, so um, positive and happy in this very <laughs> strange time and uh, being such a perfect partner to imagine this uh, wonderful uh, series of talks about the future of museums. Um, I think this is a very positive um, talk that we're having, all these three talks, but I think it's, if we thought that maybe a year ago uh, museums are going to be over, no one's going to attend, we're going to have the green pass and so on. I think future of museums is very interesting and challenging. And it's, um, it's going to be, it's, I'm, I'm very happy that we are able to be part of it um, and to reimagine um, what, what, what's our role in this uh, future of museums. Um, thank you so much. Thank you, and thank you, Paulina, too. Thank you, for thank you Paulina, for everything. Thank you, Mayan, and thank you, Tom, for taking care of us. Shana Tova. Happy New Year for us. Happy New Year. <laughs> Happy New Year. Thank you for an amazing experience today.
Thank you. Bye, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.